Well, this morning we're gonna. I was, I was joking around with Daisy earlier. I will say this. Daisy texts me and goes, "You know, we're, we're not in Revelation anymore, right?" And I was like, "Well, God did reveal a new chapter to me today, so no, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're out of Revelation, I promise." But like I said earlier, we're going to start a new series called The Loving Shepherd. And this is a series based on Psalm 23, going through the, the famous psalm that probably many of us have heard many times. We literally just sang the psalm, the psalm uh, earlier. If you've been to uh, a funeral, that's probably where you've heard it from. Psalm 23, read is, I use that psalm for every funeral I do. Um, because it, that's just kind of the, the traditional psalm to bring comfort during a time of grief and mourning. But the psalm is so much deeper than that. It's, it's richer than that. And so you guys are going to kind of be my guinea pigs a little bit because this uh, message is based on a book that I'm working on called The Loving Shepherd. And that actually image there is going to be the book cover, I believe, unless I change it. But so it's, uh, it's a book that will be released at some point, you know, when I feel like I'm finally done with it. But uh, it's written. I've had somebody read through it and I'm going to have somebody edit it uh, to make sure that I don't make any grammatical mistakes, even though I was an English major in college. So, but you never know, you might make some mistakes. But when you hear, the beginning of that Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. What images come into your mind? Just think about that for a little bit. What images come into your mind? Probably that one since you're looking at it on TV. If you've grown up in church, gone to church at all at some point in your life, you've probably heard those words read during the message. Like I said earlier, you might have heard about a funeral service if you've ever been to one. Because it's a very common passage to hear during that time of mourning because it does bring us comfort but like I said it's a little bit it's, it's deeper than that it's richer than that Psalm 23 was written by King David we don't exactly know when he wrote Psalm 23 some have suggested they wrote it more towards the end of his life as he was reflecting back on his life which does make sense but regardless when David wrote the psalm it's become a timeless song. Because that's what it's, the psalms are all songs. They were meant to be sung. This lasted for generations, but not only lasted for generations, it's impacted generations. But my question for us is, do we really pay attention to what the psalm is telling us about God? Because I, I think this psalm, Psalm 23, reveals a lot about who God is and how he wants us to know him. So many are trying to discover God and there are many ideas floating out there about who God is and what he's all about. But I think Psalm 23 gives us a pretty clear picture of who God is. He is a loving shepherd. But what does that mean for us? Like, yeah, that's great to hear. He's a loving shepherd, but what does that mean? What does that mean for us on a daily basis as we go through our, our daily lives and we deal with struggles and frustrations and anxieties and stress and even joys and happiness and all those kind of things? We deal with health problems. We deal with health problems we didn't expect. What does it mean that God is such a loving shepherd to us? We can talk about it here on Sunday, but does it leave this place? Does it leave these four walls with us? So the first thing we're going to look at today is that is the first part of Psalm 23. We're only looking at the first verse of Psalm 23 today. And the first thing we're looking at is my shepherd. If you want to follow along with interactive sermon notes, you can go to sermons.church on your smartphones and type in Chelmsford Bible Church, and there are sermon notes there with scripture references. But my shepherd, what does my shepherd mean? So in Psalm 23, verse 1, the first part of verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. So what is that? Well, when David said that the Lord was his shepherd, David knew what he was talking about firsthand, or at least he seems that way. When you read those words, the Lord is my shepherd, it's almost like you're, you're thinking to yourself, David must have some firsthand experience 
of God being his shepherd. And what's interesting about that statement is that David was one of those in the, in the Bible that never really saw God face to face. Never really heard the voice of God audibly. He was anointed to be king of Israel. He was confronted over you know, sin that he did when he had an affair with, he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed. But David never saw God face to face, not like Moses. Moses went up on Mount Sinai, got to be in the presence of the glory of God. Moses' face shone like lightning because he was in the very presence of God. But David never got that experience. But then, but David, in his opening statement of Psalm 23, this psalm, it all sounded like so confident that the Lord was his shepherd. Like he had this first hand experience of God being his shepherd. And I think the reason David used that terminology for God, because it's an interesting terminology. When you're talking about God, and you're going to think about who God is. And if I say the word God, and you start picturing maybe in your mind who you think God looks like, I don't know if you're going to necessarily picture a shepherd. Because a shepherd in, the, in ancient times, they were not the most well-respected people in the world. But for David, David, before he was king, was a shepherd. And the problem, when David was being a shepherd, when that was his role at his house, that's when he was anointed king of Israel. I want to do, I want to take a little moment to go, take a moment to go to that part of scripture in 1 Samuel 16, starting in verse 6. This is what is recorded here when Samuel the prophet goes to David's house to anoint him to be the next king of Israel. It says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Eliab was David's oldest brother. He was the firstborn of Jesse, David's father. And so for ancient people, the firstborn were usually the ones that got the inheritance that, that became the next leader of the family. And so Samuel's looking at Eliab and he looks like a king. And he's thinking to himself, this must be the Lord's anointed. He's standing right here in front of me. He's like a tall, handsome guy. This must be the guy. He's strong. Verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. I like how God puts in heights, right? This guy must have been tall. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shabbat pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Arise and anoint him. This is the one. Imagine being one of David's brothers. Imagine being Eliab, the oldest. You're out here, tall, handsome guy, you're strong. You're, you're the firstborn. You're thinking to yourself, Oh, I'm going to be the next king of Israel. This is awesome. And then God says no. And then one brother after another, after another, after another, God says no. And then here comes the pump David, the shepherd, the, ones who hang, the one who hangs out with the sheep all the time, who probably smells and is weird. And God says, that's the one. So when David said, the Lord was his shepherd, David knew firsthand what a shepherd was like. Again, this is an interesting choice because shepherds did not have a great reputation in the ancient world. They had a reputation as liars. So I'm sure David's brothers probably, David, probably thought David was a liar. They thought he was odd. But David probably didn't care. 
Think about shepherds where they were dedicated to what they did. They were dedicated to the sheep. He would care for the sheep that belonged to them, whether to belong to him and his family. He wanted to make sure that he did everything he could to make sure the sheep were well cared for. And what is even more interesting is that David said the Lord was his shepherd. Usually sheep were found in a flock. A shepherd was focused on caring for the flock as a whole, not necessarily focused on each individual sheep. But God is a better shepherd than even David was. Because God looks at the flock, yes, but he looks at the flock as individuals, a flock made up of individuals. You see, God does not see us as one face in a crowd of a sea of faces. God sees us for who we are. The scripture tells us that he knows every hair that is on our head, or it may be for some of us, every hair that has fallen out of our head. Okay? God knows us. This is important, especially in the context David was writing in, because in the ancient Middle East, the community would oftentimes take precedent over the individual. David wanted his readers to know that God cares about the community and the individual equally. He neglects neither. This is why people flocked to Jesus. When he was doing his ministry on earth, he had compassion on people. He didn't just care about the people as a whole. He also cared deeply for each individual person he interacted with. Right around the time that Jesus was about to be arrested and crucified, the religious leaders were together to discuss this problem about Jesus and say, we've got a problem here. And this is in John's gospel after Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And they're thinking to themselves, if word spreads that this guy is starting to raise people from the dead, Rome is going to be all over us. And the high priest said that that year, or that day, Caiaphas, he said, it's better that one man die than the whole nation suffer. That the whole nation perish. You see, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they cared about just the nation. They didn't necessarily care about the individual people, they just cared about the nation. People flocked to Jesus because he was the exact opposite. Yes, he cared about the people as a, as a whole, but he cared about individuals. And people flocked to him. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, this is what the Gospel of Matthew records. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says this. When he saw the crowds, people coming to him, because he'd go into villages and people flocked to him. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like, what does it say? Sheep. Without what? A shepherd. The religious leaders of Jesus, they were supposed to be shepherds. They weren't. Jesus came to be the good shepherd. The loving shepherd. The shepherd that David wrote about when he said, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus was the image of the invisible God. He came to show us what God is really like. He came to show us that God is our shepherd who hears us, who cares for us, and loves us. He is our shepherd who hears us when we call him. In Psalm 66, verses 17, to 17, 17 through 20, Psalm 66, 17 through 20, this is what it says in this psalm. I cried to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has, he, and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. You know, some people think that God is going to, doesn't listen to us when we pray. They may think to themselves, you know what, I'm too bad of a person. I've done too many bad things or I've ignored God for too long. There's no way he listens to us. Or God is way too busy to listen to the prayers of my, of my mouth. My concerns and my struggles are just too small for him. He has bigger things to worry about. I mean, there's a whole war going in the Middle East right now. He's worried about that. Yes, he is, but he's also worried about your quote unquote little problems too. And guess what? 
You, ne- you haven't done anything so bad that God will not hear you when you call to him in faith. Because the thing about shepherds is when the sheep wanders off, the shepherd doesn't go, well, I guess I'm not going after that one. That's the stupid sheep. I told that. I tell the sheep all the time, stay together. But that one keeps wandering off, so I'm not going back for it. I'm not going, I'm not going to get him this time. No, the shepherd, like Jesus said, leaves the 99 and goes find the one. The one that calls. In John 17, in John 17, this is what is recorded here, John 17, verses 27 through 30. I'm sorry, John 10. John 10, my bad. John 10, verses 27 to 30. This is what it said here. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. That didn't sit well with the religious leaders when Jesus started calling himself equal to the Father, to God himself. But the reason Jesus said that my sheep, I know my sheep, my sheep know me, and no one can snatch them out of my hand, because Jesus wasn't just a simple um, a prophet. Jesus wasn't just a great teacher. Jesus wasn't just a good human being. Jesus was God himself. And when we give our lives to Jesus, we are giving our lives to the God of the universe. And when we place ourselves in the hands of Jesus, Jesus holds us and nothing can take us out of his hand. Nothing. Jesus is a good shepherd indeed. And he's our shepherd. Not just as a whole, but us as individuals. The second thing I want to look at this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, yes. The second thing is that we shouldn't want. Not wanting. Because in Psalm 23, in the second part of verse 1, after David says, the Lord is my shepherd, he says this, I shall not be in want. Now what does that mean? Like we just cease wanting stuff. Well, no, we're human beings. We're always going to want stuff. You know, we like to, we oftentimes like to confuse wants with needs, right? We say, well, you know what? I really need that uh, Lamborghini that I saw in the North End, you know? I really need that. Do you need it or do you just want it? I really need a new wardrobe because it's fall and it's colder, so I really need one. Do we really need it or we want it? I really, really need that whole cheesecake from Cheesecake Factory. I just need the whole thing. I mean, yeah, we all want the cheesecake from Cheesecake Factory, right? I mean, it's like you go to Cheesecake Factory and order your food, and then you're like, oh, we can't. I need the cheesecake because we're a Cheesecake Factory, right? Even though your stomach's going, stop, please. <laughs> Did you just see how much we consume? Can you stop, please? And none of us actually do. I don't think I've ever taken cheesecake home with me from Cheesecake Factory. I would just pound that thing, and then my stomach's like, you are going to regret that later. I'm going to kill you. But when we give our lives to Christ, when we give our lives to God, our perspective on life begins to change. Because the Lord is our shepherd, we don't have to want for anything. At least, that's what David wrote. The original Hebrew word that he used, it means become empty, decreased, depriving, lacking. So in other words, David essentially wrote this, I shall not become empty. I shall lack nothing. Remember Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well? He offered her living water. He said, you can have this living water. And she says, give me this living water so I'll have to keep coming back to this well. 
She wanted to be filled. She didn't want to be empty anymore because that's how she was feeling. For David, God was everything. God was the one who could, who would provide all that David needed. And David trusted that the Lord had his back and would always be there to provide for his basic needs. And then some. David knew that he didn't need to worry about provision because God would always be there to provide. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33, Jesus talks about kind of our, addresses our wrestling with wants and needs and what we think we need, what we think we want, our, our kind of worries about everyday life. And he says this, I'm actually going to start in verse uh, 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See, Jesus said we don't have to worry about clothes, we don't have to go buy more clothes now. Okay. See how the flowers of the field grow, they do not labor or spin, and I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus trying to address this like, look, rest in God. Let God be your shepherd. Let God take care of you. We have a hard time as human beings letting other people take care of us, don't we? I am like, when I, I've had surgeries and things in the past, and I am the worst patient in the world. Because I will get up and do things for myself, and Alex like yelling at me, like, what are you doing? And I can do it, it's fine. I can do it. There was, there was a few years back when I had wrist surgery, I had my whole wrist reconstructed. My, my left arm. And it, two days later, we had a massive snowstorm. Well, not massive, but it was just heavy, wet snow. And so Alex's out there, like, shoveling away, trying to shovel this heavy snow up near the front of the driveway, you know, where all the plows, like, to pile it on. You know, the, the town of Joseph loves to remind everyone it's winter time, so please don't throw snow into the roads. And, like, but they can throw it into our driveways. It's like, great, thanks. And she's out there trying to struggle along. And finally, I was like, you know what? I can't watch this anymore. Threw on my coat, just tucked my arm in. It's like, give me the shovel. And I grabbed the shovel with my right arm, which is my weak arm, and started shoveling just so I could give her a break. But that's how I am because we as human beings do not like to ask for help. We don't like to have people take care of us. But God in Scripture is going, will you just stop and let me take care of you? David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I like to think that David wrote that towards the end of his life because I don't, we, as we get quote unquote older, we hopefully get a little bit wiser and we realize, man, we were dumb back in the day. And maybe David was writing those words and he's looking back and like, man, I was dumb back in the day. Why didn't I just learn and say, did God just take care of me? There will be times when our faith will waver. There will be times when fear will creep in, but those are the times when God will be closer than we realize. He will be there to whisper to us to trust Him. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, this is the story of Abraham. And God speaks to Abraham. This is before he was named Abraham. He was called Abram at the time. Now, the thing about Abram, you've got to remember, is that Abram left his homeland, which was by far something you did not do in the ancient world. You did not leave your homeland to go to some place that this guy up somewhere told you to go and he's going to show you. It was very odd. Nomads really were not a thing back then. But Abram believed God. It was credit to his righteousness, as Scripture says, and followed. 
And this is what God says to Abram in chapter 15 of Genesis, starting verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. This is what, notice how, what God says right now. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your great reward. It's almost like God is, is addressing the fears and anxieties of Abram before Abram even expresses them. And when we think, oh, God doesn't, God doesn't really care about me, God knows you. And God sees you, and God even hears the thoughts that you're thinking before you even say them out loud. So I'm sure Abram was struggling. Maybe his faith was wavering, and God went right to him and says, do not be afraid. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Sometimes we think we need to hold back when it comes to talking to God, but guess what? God's big, and he can handle our frustrations. I don't think Abram really said that lightly. I don't think Abram was going, well, see, God, I got some issues here. I think Abram was frustrated. I think Abram was like, look, you called me to go out of, to leave my homeland and go to this land and show me, and you promised me a child, and what's up? I'm getting older here, so is my wife. And a servant in my household is going to inherit my estate. I think Abram was frustrated. Verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And here's the verse, and I just quoted this a minute ago. That's the key to this whole passage. Abram believed God. And it was credited to his righteousness. Did Abram see the amount of descendants he would have? No. He saw Isaac. That's it. As far as I know, there's way more stars in the sky than one. He saw Isaac. God promised him descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And it said, Abram believed God. When it says believe God in his credit and his righteousness, Abram was all in, even though he never saw any of the promises of God fulfilled in his lifetime. Never. And we sit there sometimes and go, God, you need to show us some signs here. Come on, keep proving yourself. Come on. Jesus had to deal with that. They said, hey, why don't you show us a sign to prove who you say you are? It's almost like I, I literally just fed like over 5,000 people. I've walked on water, I've turned water into water. Like, what else do you need? I feel sick. I touch lepers and they're healed. I tell people to come out of their graves and they come out. What else do you need? But it's hard for us in the modern world because seeing is believing for us. We have a hard time believing without seeing it. If we can't see it, then it must not exist. But there are plenty of things we trust in that we can't see. We learn in school that plants make oxygen, but I've never seen a plant actually make oxygen. I can see plants, and I, I was told that they make oxygen, but I've never actually seen oxygen, O2, come out of them. I've never seen them take in carbon dioxide that we breathe out. I've actually never seen carbon, well, I guess that's not true. It's winter, winter's coming. You do see the carbon dioxide from running around something. But I know oxygen is there because I breathe it. I trust that the plants are still making it. We trust in pilots to fly us to and fro. How many of you have ever walked on an airplane and gone to the cockpit and say, hey, can you show me your credentials? Good luck with that. <laughs> Please don't try that, you might get arrested. <laughs> You go in the cockpit and say, can you show me every button and every knob and every whistle, bell and whistle that's in here? Can you show me that it's working properly? Can you prove that to me right now before I sit in my seat? Okay? They will call the police and you will be arrested. Okay? Don't do that. We don't do that. We just go in. We find our seat. We put our headphones on and say, please don't bother me. Okay? No, I, I maybe don't. But you trust that the pilots know what they're doing. You trust that the plane is working. You trust. You don't see it. You 
trust him. How many of you have got your cars without thinking about it and drove here this morning? Obviously all of you, okay, because <laughs> you're here. But you didn't go check your car, did you? You didn't go check everything, every nook and cranny in your car to make sure it was working. Okay, maybe Ernie, you, were, you might have rode your bike here, so. You don't do that, you just trust that it's going to work. We say we live in a seeing is believing society, but there is a lot of faith involved in our everyday lives as human beings. So when we hear the message, you need to trust in God, you need to have faith in God, and we walk in that, it's like, well, what's faith? What's faith? I don't deal with faith. Yes, you do every day. You deal with faith every day. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, this is what Solomon, David's son, wrote in Ecclesiastes. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Solomon's had a bad day, I guess. But he's looking back on his life and going, I pursued all these things, all these material things, all of this power and wealth and fame. I pursued it and pursued it and pursued it. And what did it leave me at the end of my life? It was all meaningless because I can't take it all with me. And then if you skip down, skip to the end of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, verses 3 through 4, this is what Solomon says, this is the meaning of life. When the keepers of the house tremble, when the strong men stoop, and when the grinders cease because they are few, when those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the streets are closed, when the sound of grinding fades, when people rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. Verse 5, when people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, <clears throat> when the almond trees blossom, the grasshoppers drag itself along and desire no longer stir, the people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him. Remember him. Who is him? Well, if he says in verse 1, remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Solomon said, look, all this stuff we pursue in life, all this stuff we give our energy to, it's all meaningless. This is what's important. This is what life is all about. Remember him, your creator, the Lord, who is your shepherd. When we trust in the Lord, we shouldn't want anything because nothing else compares to him. Just compare it to everything else you have tried. How did it work out? Are you still trying? That's what you have to ask yourself. Everything you've tried to replace God with, did it work? And if the answer is no, then why haven't you tried anything? <laughs> When David wrote that he shall not want, he was writing that to all of us. He was writing a reminder that when God is our shepherd, he is in control, and there's no better place to be. Amen? Amen. Amen.